Uh, but our next and final afternoon speaker is uh, Joshua Walker, who's been with the uh, Eurasia Group uh, here in Washington, D.C. for some years, and is moving on to uh, New York City to have the uh, Japan Society. Uh, exciting new adventure for him. Uh, Andrew's the son of uh, missionaries. He was Baptist. Came sort of a Methodist, sort of a big head Episcopalian thing. Uh, so he is ecumenical, and uh, I'm sure he's going to have a great message for us. Uh, thank you. I feel like now I need to defend myself in terms of these different denominational things. So I, I still consider myself a Baptist as a Baptist heritage. I will not give that up, obviously. Uh, but politics has changed a lot of things in this country, uh, including the way we look at uh, religion, which is unfortunate. Uh, what I want to talk about is really the idea of grand strategy. And I want to use my own personal background. Because I think when we talk about grand strategy, oftentimes uh, we put it in this very uh, you know, august setting. And it's hard to say anything without acknowledging these very formidable military leaders behind me, right? This is who does grand strategy, right? Not some geeky dude like me or any of the folks in this room. But I actually think that now in the era we're living in, uh, grand strategy has never been more applicable uh, to each of you uh, than it was to these individuals. You have the most powerful weapon in the world sitting right in front of you that you're trying to avoid looking at right now. Uh, that iPhone, that smartphone that you have, connects you to the entire world. And I want to use my own personal narrative as someone who grew up in Japan with Southern Baptist missionaries who've been there for 40 years uh, and spent most of my professional life working on the Republic of Turkey that just celebrated its 96th birthday uh, a couple of days ago on the same day uh, that the U.S. Congress uh, passed the Armenian Genocide Resolution, uh, finally declaring uh, uh, that what happened in 1915 was a genocide, and to think about the worlds colliding in a different way. Uh, so by, by a brief biographical uh, sketch, um, if you read the most recent version, uh, the most uh, edition of Providence, you'll see an article in there that kind of lays out my experience with Turkey. So I don't feel like I need to actually get into it. Uh, I'll just do a quick uh, commercial about that uh, in the, uh, the journal that uh, Mark has already talked about uh, probably extensively today. But the bottom line is, I felt in many ways that when I left Japan, I was never going to look back. Uh, because Japan, in many ways, as you know, uh, was this formidable player that during uh, before World War II was kind of the guardian of Asia. It was kind of, in some ways, uh, that generation's China. Uh, it was in the 1980s, very much like China is today. The difference, of course, was in 1980 when Japan was considered to be number one and they were buying up all the Rockefeller Center and all these areas uh, in America. Uh, we still had American military forces there. So no matter how heated the economic debates became or about cars or beef or whatever else, we had the upper hand as Americans because we had military forces. They didn't have military forces. The debate now has dramatically changed, right? Japan has no illusions about being number one. Uh, and I think after the disaster, the triple disaster, as it's called, on March 11, 2011, which really was a turning point for me in my life as well, because I lost contact with my parents that day. Uh, they were in the affected region. Uh, cell phones were just not working. It happened to be a couple of days before my birthday. Uh, and not being able to get all your parents kind of shakes you. I'm sorry for the pun there, but like it really shakes you to your core to find out that your parents, who are supposed to be living in one of the most stable, democratic countries, uh, you can't reach them. And it made me evaluate uh, what my own calling in life was, my own passion. What I realized was it wasn't necessarily to any individual country or people. My parents feel very particularly called to Japan. You can't serve in a country for 40 years uh, with as little success as numerically uh, they have in Japan. My parents had a choice of going to either Japan or Korea. I joke that they always made the wrong choice. 50% of South Korea is Christian, about 1% of Japan is Christian, and Japan is one of the most advanced societies in the world where you're born Buddhist, you're married Christian, and you die Shinto because that's kind of the fluidity of religion to them. It's more about formulaic uh, kind of expressions, and it's kind of all roads lead to the same place, which is a very different viewpoint uh, than particularly evangelicals who would take on the world. Um, and so for me, that, that, that disaster allowed me to come back and really see Japan through a new lens. But I spent most of my professional career working on a country uh, that most of us equate uh, with Thanksgiving, because when you say, I'm a turkey expert, your first question is, do you know how to carve it? And you, know, you can also make funny jokes about that. But there's not really a country that's as uh, consequential in many ways to the debate currently, even in Washington. Now, we're not really talking about foreign policy in Washington, because we have the Nats on the World Series side, uh, go Nats. And then on the other side, we have an impeachment trial. So, you know, the foreign policy is just not in our purview right now. It's just not the main focus of what's going on in Washington. But as you know, if you live in Washington or you come through Washington, everybody else in the world knows what we're doing in Washington. Like, 
everybody has a strategic relationship with the United States. Like every country that has an embassy right here along Embassy Row will talk about the U.S. as one of its strategic allies. And we use that term a lot, I mean, the strategic relationship with Turkey, strategic relationship with Japan. But really, we're not being very sincere because I think the U.S. Uh, cares a lot more about our own internal interests and we're more tactical. We're not strategic in our thinking. And I think it's only gotten worse uh, in the last decade because of American domestic politics. Uh, what my current boss, Ian Bremer, talks a lot about is this concept of the G0 world. Now, you kind of have to play on words, right? The G7, the G20. Really, none of those institutions, as we have seen very vividly in the last couple of years, uh, have really been able to keep the, the, the system that we think of from uh, to making major disasters, right? It didn't stop the economic crisis back in 2008. Uh, it certainly didn't stop the Syrian crisis that's ongoing. It didn't stop the Arab Spring. It really, in some ways, is just an opportunity for uh, those that have to come and talk about those that have not, and not really empower either side. And I think in many ways, as Christians, we fall right in between this, right? There are many of us that are privileged to work in this space who are people of deep faith, and, and many of you are represented in this room, but oftentimes we find ourselves at a loss because our Christian tradition and our uh, social justice side of things kind of compels us to, to kind of you know, care for the, the least of these, but those of us that are more hard-headed on the realist side are like, okay, how do we deal with this? And that's kind of where the Christian realism tradition has come out, and I know you've heard about today. But I think grand strategy oftentimes is equated with only one side of that equation. I mean, it's kind of like, well, if you're a bleeding heart liberal and, and you care about uh, these poor orphans and, and refugees, you can't possibly know anything about grand strategy. And I would argue that actually the same way that my own life uh, and my own work at the State Department and other places has led me, I don't think that diplomacy anymore is being done just by people with pinstripe suits in the State, uh, suits in the State Department. It's done by each of you when you travel around the world and when you say, I'm a Christian or I'm an American. You've just branded yourself. You've just unofficially become an ambassador because everything you do uh, is a reflection of those communities from which you come and uh, the hats through which you wear. And I think that in, in the world where it's increasingly leaderless, where this is not a statement directly about what's happening in this town, I think in general I can say that we're lacking leadership, full stop, in our churches, in our communities, in our nations. We're lacking leadership. Now, you can blame one individual and say, well, it's all Trump's fault in the populist movement that led to his election. You can blame the Brits for Brexit. You can blame a lot of different people. But really, this is it's about a symptom versus a cause, right? Um, my, my particular political persuasions will not surprise you having worked for Secretary Clinton, so you know that I was not a big fan of the current president, but he's our president. Right? And I want him to be successful. I believe in America's place in the world. And so, uh, unlike some of my other friends who are spending a lot more time doing other things, I believe that American Grand Strategy needs to figure out how to maximize uh, our abilities, our resources, to a maximum end. Right? And I think that one of the challenges that we have when I think about uh, the two countries I love dearly and spent a lot of my professional and personal career in, both growing up in Japan from 1 to 18, and then working on Turkey both as a Fulbright scholar, as an embassy official, as a State Department official, uh, and, and as a scholar and a researcher uh, for over two decades now, um, I, I see a tale of two countries, right? If you think about Turkey uh, in 2002 when I first went to Turkey, uh, you had a new and shiny uh, government that came to power, led by then mayor of Istanbul, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who basically used his religious beliefs as a devout Sunni to make the case that Turkey needed to unshackle itself from its Kemalist legacy, the secular past that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the founder of the republic, had found, and that it was time that the hidden middle class stepped up. In many ways, you could argue that the Anatolian Tigers, so-called, in places like Kaysavi and other parts of the Anatolian heartland, uh, in some ways followed on a Calvinist tradition, right? They, they wore their religion on their sleeves. They used it to kind of show that they were not corrupt. The word uh, white in Turkish, Ak, is the same as the party in power, Ak party. So it was basically an implicit criticism of the corruption of the old Turkish system. They swept to power, and because of some technicalities, they won close to 40% of the vote, but they got close to 70% of the Turkish parliament. And in a system that has over 20 uh, parties, one party with that high number uh, immediately rules. And they've been in power since then. They haven't let go of power. In fact, if anything, that party has been morphed into one individual. And that mayor that had that bright future, who led Turkey towards the EU with the promise of an EU membership, and also uh, his ability to kind of look at his surrounding environment and find strategic environments for Turkey to play a decisive role, uh, has only been honed. But instead of it being honed by the West, 
and by uh, its tutelage from the European Union or its relationship with America, increasingly is looking more and more to the authoritarian regimes of the region, particularly Mr. Putin of Russia and Xi Jinping of China, uh, which is a very dangerous trend in many different ways. Because if I look at this from uh, a purely geographic scope, uh, Turkey has always, from the Ottoman times until current, occupied a, a very unique place, right? When you think about where uh, West and East meet and all the cliches you can think of with Turkey, uh, it's been part of every major world event in some sense or the other, right? Um, this is where the Gordian knot quite literally is. Uh, this is where Noah's Ark is rumored to actually be. Uh, this is where the Roman Empire met its untimely end with the Byzantine Empire when the, the Muslims swept out from Saudi Arabia. It was not the, the Arabs uh, or others who really uh, made uh, Islam and the Islamic theocracy into a worldwide empire. It was the Turks. Uh, and the struggle in the Middle East has never really been about Arabs uh, and Jews. It's really been between the Persians and the Turks. And right now, you see that playing out in spades with Turkey's role in the world, with Iran's role in the world. Turkey, which has always been a reliable U.S. and NATO ally, is now in danger of no longer being anchored in the West, which, you know, my Turkish friends could be very angry at me for saying that, but I think it's a statement of reality at this point. When you have an American administration uh, that has a warm personal relationship, president to president, but our societies and our governments have never been as far apart uh, to the point that we're now about to sanction them uh, and we're also uh, thinking about ways of, of diminishing their role in NATO, despite having the second largest military and being the only Muslim majority nation that plays a particularly unique and important role, particularly in my own life. When I think about a post 9 11 environment, a lot of our policy in Turkey was to do things in such a way that we could not be accused of uh, perpetuating a global war on Islam. Right? Uh, by having Turkey with us in Afghanistan, by having Turkey with us uh, in what was coming after the Iraq War, um, America was trying to have a grand strategy that ultimately did not uh, end very well for us, and we still have uh, the so-called endless wars that are ongoing. But I think about the spectacular way in which Turkey has changed and, and, and uh, dramatically uh, reoriented itself, not necessarily because Turkey made a particular choice, uh, but because the environment in which it found itself changed. If you think about the Syrian civil war, it's a great example. Uh, Turkey, uh, there was no country and no leader that was more anti-Assad uh, or Syria than Turkey. And it was fascinating because my former uh, professor and someone I consider to be, be, be a mentor, Ahmed Davutoglu, who was the former foreign minister and then the prime minister of Turkey, uh, had a term. He used the term jewel to describe Syria. He said, Syria is the jewel of Turkish foreign policy. Because when I was there, uh, basically, Turkey was bringing Syria out of the cold and being able to bring it in. The linkages between southern Turkey and northern Syria are very robust to the point that they were, it was visa-free travel. So my friends from Gaziantep could easily jump in a car and drive down to Damascus. They could go to many of the Aleppo and, and areas that used to be these great cities of civilization that have now been reduced to rubble. And so when Assad began his murderous campaign against his own people and the uprising uh, reached its climax, while we were debating red lines and about resolutions, the Turks were taking action. Now, of course, the action that the Turks were taking were very self-guided and self-directional. They had been very consistent over the last five years. They had been telegraphing what they were about to do in northern Syria for a very long time. There have been no uh, question what the Turks believe the YPG represents. There's no question what they believe the Kurdish allies of uh, CENTCOM uh, represent. They call them exactly what they are, terrorists. Uh, and they also has had a very clear view on what that means. Turks will tell you that this is not a war against Kurds. It's hard to believe that given some of the actions of the last couple of weeks, obviously. Uh, and I think America necessarily now has blood on our hands. This is not the first time we sold out the Kurds, nor will unfortunately be the last time. It breaks my heart given that I have so many friends of the region. Uh, and the problem, of course, is we all share a similar destiny when I think about the, the future of the region, right? When I think about the Ottoman Empire and what kept that together so well, it was not uh, a very strong imperial force at the top. It was that they basically allowed the, the, the regional rule to take place. And I think what I've seen uh, in the last couple of years has been particularly problematic because even among uh, the Kurdish um, fighters, there's not a sense of unity, right? The Kurds of northern Iraq, the Kurds of Iran, the Kurds of Turkey, the Kurds of Syria, uh, there is no one unifying force that speaks on behalf. And so uh, when you have the complete about face and you have the U.S. president that does not prevent um, the Turkish forces from entering, in which we knew what was going to happen next. I think everybody in the national security establishment uh, knew what was coming. 
Uh, you then have what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, and then now you see a case in which the Kurds have basically flipped from being U.S. allies to working with the Russians because they're realists. They have to deal with the neighborhood. If we're not going to put our troops in harm way, it's not that our couple hundred of special forces are going to actually stop the advancing Turkish forces, but it's a signal. And the Turks will not cross that. They understand the force of the U.S. military. They would not do that. But when uh, President Trump signaled to President Erdogan that it was okay and that you could you know, take care of your business, um, it was a real uh, disaster that unfolded. Um, and of course, the, the thing that really is problematic for me in a lot of different ways is if there was a longer-term strategy there that said, okay, we're going to lose the Kurds and we're going to get closer to the Turks, this might actually work because Turkey's got a large military. Maybe it's worth selling out a selling out a friend because of the greater good or whatever cliche you want to use, but instead it actually was an own goal, right? If you play soccer, you know, when you turn around and kick it to your own goalie and the goalie's not there and you score, that's kind of what you call it. It's pretty disastrous. And so now we're trying to pick up the pieces. Um, the irony, of course, is that as Turkey as a country and as a, a civilization and as a population has gone through a very dark period of time beginning with the coup a couple years ago, coup attempt, I should call it, uh, and it's estrangement with the U.S., uh, there have been some positive developments. If you look at the new mayor of Istanbul, no one would have expected that in a country that has been uh, problematic uh, from an authoritarian point of view for a while. Uh, you have a new mayor that represents a different political persuasion, a different type of party. Uh, it's widely seen that he will probably challenge Erdogan at some point in time. Looks like if the trends continue that he would have a pretty good chance given that the Turkish economy is in a pretty uh, difficult spot. But at the same time, Turkey has gone through this monumental uh, reshifting of its international priorities from going Western and focusing on the West, which has more or less fallen apart, right? When you think about European institutions, when you think about populism at home uh, and in Europe, we're weaker than we've ever been. We're more internally focused than we've ever been. It's very hard to trust the United States, not just with what just happened to the Kurds, but when you think about all of the things that we've been doing. So whatever your political view may be about uh, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership or the Transatlantic uh, Trade Zone or whether it's the climate, uh, Paris Climate Accord, even if you personally don't believe in those things, um, there is now a question mark when it comes to U.S. leadership in the world. And while we may have the military power, the so-called hard powers, Professor Nye at Harvard talks about um, the soft power of the U.S., the attractiveness of the U.S., is on the decline. And so while we have amazing uh, institutions and educational facilities, we have Hollywood, which I guess still produces movies that people watch, uh, and we have pop culture that continues to give us such gems as Kim Kardashian, um, what American culture and civilization looks like is beginning to look in more and more like the decadence of Rome as opposed to the rise. And it, it concerns me because I, I'm one of these Americans that believes that America's place in the world is one uh, to be a model or to be a city on the hill as Reagan and many other presidents before have called about it. The one bright spot that I will focus on is Japan. Uh, Japan doesn't really have any illusions of being number one. But it does have a, have a role to play as the third largest economy in the world. It went through its own disasters, I, as I described in 2011. But as a result of that disaster, the political experiment of the new political party was kind of thrown out. And the old guard and the ruling party in Japan came back with a vengeance. And a former prime minister that had failed miserably one time before came back and now is about to become the longest serving <laughs> prime minister in Japanese history. And one of his keys to success has been that he basically has learned from that mistake in that period of time. A lot of his associates will talk to you about the idea that uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, never forgets what it was like to fail so abjectly and to understand what humility truly looks like. And in many ways, Japanese grand strategy, if I can put that term on it, is to basically go beyond their region. They have such problematic history with its own neighborhood because of the imperial history uh, of World War II and the lead up to what they call the Pacific War uh, that led to Pearl Harbor and all the history that we know of. Um, you have deep-seated feelings of, between Koreans and Chinese and Japanese that you can't erase, right? They, these scars are there. Um, obviously, everyone points to the German example and says, well, the Germans did it. You know, can't we just get past it? You tell that to any uh, Holocaust survivor. You tell that to any... Uh, Jew that watches the neo-Nazi movements that are rising in different parts of uh, Europe. And while they did a much better job than, than Japan ever did, one of the reasons that Japan left the system the way it was was because of us. Right? We occupied Japan uh, for almost close to a decade, right, under MacArthur. Uh, and when you think about the way in which we structured the international order in a post-World War II environment in Asia, that is very much American grand strategy. And whether it's the Marshall Plan uh, in Europe or whether it's the hub-and-spoke model of Asia, Japan has been a critical player in that space. And its own constitution precludes it from having a military force, and yet it's probably the seventh most largest and most sophisticated fighting force in the world that's not 
not called the military. It's called the self-defense force, euphemistically. Uh, you know, the distinction between offensive and defensive weapons is a little bit strange, right? Like, you know, it's like, well, this gun is a defensive weapon. You know, you can also kill somebody with it. Well, you know, that's semantics, right? Um, and I think that what Japan has been able to do is within this ambiguous, what I call strategic ambiguity, it's found a place for itself. So by being able to host American military forces that will be the front line or the tip of the spear, as they call, whatever happens in the Korean uh, Peninsula contingency or whatever happens with Taiwan, whatever happens uh, with mainland China or Hong Kong or Taiwan or any flashpoint, they're all coming from Japan. Uh, and the fact that there's this burden-sharing agreement that Japan is willingly paying more of, and there'll be a bigger debate next year, uh, Abe, Prime Minister Abe has really got Trump's number. He seems to understand Trump better than any other world leader. Uh, in other words, he basically flatters him to his face, and when they have disagreements, they paper it over. There's really no overt or direct attack on President Trump, uh, and there's an understanding that we need to work directly with him, mano a mano, uh, but then our bureaucracies will do different things, which has been difficult in the national security establishment, given the rotating cabinet secretaries and also the number of national security advisors that we've seen uh, under this administration. So from the Japanese point of view, they just want to stay the course, and they want to make sure that uh, no one questions their uh, commitment to the U.S.-Japan alliance. In fact, sometimes uh, they are even more in favor of it. And obviously, with the new imperial era uh, uh, upon us that was just the enthronement a couple weeks ago, uh, that was ruined a little bit by the typhoon that came through that none of us in the U.S. heard about, um, there was a feeling that uh, in, under Reiwa era, which means beautiful harmony, that Japan would be able to play a larger role, not necessarily in East Asia, but in what we now call the Indo-Pacific, right? And this is a euphemistic way of basically taking all of the part of the world that's not Western and putting it together. Because everything from the Indian subcontinent to the shores of Hawaii and Guam and everything in between is now considered the Indo-Pacific. Now, it's hard to call that a grand strategy because we don't actually have the same terminology. When a Japanese person says Indo-Pacific, they actually mean Africa too. Uh, in fact, the speech that laid out the Indo-Pacific strategy was actually first delivered by Prime Minister Abe in Nairobi, Kenya about five years ago uh, during a development conference where he basically said, we need to link these areas together. It was a not so subtle uh, alternative to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. And what's interesting is now we as the U.S. government uh, has, have adopted the Indo-Pacific strategy and something like PACOM, uh, that used to be the Pacific Command, is now transferred to become the Indo-Pacific Command. And so that shows you very clearly from a strategic point of view that we're moving in that direction. As a, as a, as a scholar and student of history, it's always very telling, right? Uh, the part of the world that I was focused on has been called everything from the Near East to the Middle East and now it's Southwest Asia, right? Which tells you the perspective. Because if it's Near East, it's near compared to who? Right? It's East in comparison to the British Empire that defined that term. It was the Middle East in relation to kind of the U.S. power positioning. It's now Southwest Asia in relevance to where East Asia is, right? Because the center of gravity is clearly moving to Asia, right? It's my friend Karad Khan has written, the future is Asian. Uh, but the bottom line is America has this amazing ability to be both European and transatlantic and Asian at the same time. And I think that's a major advantage, and particularly for those of you that are below a certain age, that is where the future is going to be, right? So if you're asking what languages you should be learning in your uh, classrooms and schools, increasingly it's going to be Chinese, increasingly it's going to be uh, languages of Asia, whether it's the fastest growing population in India or it's the most lucrative populations. Um, this is where increasingly the center of gravity is going. It's not as much French or German anymore. Most people are not going uh, to Paris and, and Berlin, even other fabulous cities. You go there to eat food and enjoy art and culture like you do in Rome, uh, but nobody goes to Rome anymore to learn about grand strategy. We're learning history when it comes to the Roman Empire. It doesn't have any relevance today. But I think directly looking at uh, what the future of U.S. foreign policy towards China uh, is going to be the direction that all of us are going to be struggling with moving forward. I think that history is yet to be written from a government point of view, but I increasingly am beginning to think that that history is not going to be written by what it, one individual president does here in Washington, but by what the mayors and governors of other states, and increasingly private sector businesses. I would argue that Mark Zuckerberg has more influence uh, in terms of the global empire than sometimes the President of the United States with the ability he has to shape the preferences and guidance and uh, get inside of your mind with the phone that you have in front of you and these wonderful little red dots that pop up to notify you of the likes you get and we're literally like primal apes that are like, oh, I got more like here. And you, 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 literally there's studies that show that your mood is affected by these things. If that's not a grand strategic challenge for us, I don't really know what is. Uh, and you think about the ability uh, that companies have 
uh, to shape our preferences and likes uh, in a very successful PR and commercial sense, um, it makes me wonder how a U.S. government is going to compete with that. Because when you look at the senators who question uh, these tech startup leaders, it's clear that we're just in different generations that don't have even an understanding. You know, when you watch the Twitter account of the late John McCain, it was like, it was basically humorous to watch, right? Because you know that John McCain doesn't actually do it himself. You know that he doesn't even use email, and they're coming up with pithy memes and other things that don't really fit at all. You know, with President Trump, none of us question whether he uses that phone or not. <laughs> Literally, I'm living in an age of uh, uh, diplomacy at this point in time. But I think with some of these leaders, it's kind of a, you know, there's a word in Japanese which is tatemai, which means what we put out in front of everyone, kind of a screen, and then honne, which is the true self. I think the divide between these two worlds have gotten even more extreme in social media. And I think that's going to play itself out in a diplomatic sense as well, where we've always had diplomats that go and have to deliver tough messages or, or smile and say things that may or may not be true, but have to represent the best interests of their country. Increasingly, we all are having to do that, right? Uh, and whether or not you want to represent your country or your faith or your family or any creed you come from, you are going to be called upon because you are your own individual brand. And in a world in which each of you has to compete for brand space, uh, what does that mean uh, when you're bringing online a billion people at a time, you're bringing in people who want to have the American dream and the American lifestyle? It's something that we as Americans don't really have to think as much about, although it's very telling that if you walk a couple blocks over here and go right by the most powerful house in the world, you will find homeless people literally sheltered right there, right? It's something that all of my international friends point to me, but doesn't really strike many of us as being strange, despite our faith tradition, because we're so used to it, we've been able to become a little bit cynical and jaded to it. So I'll, I'll simply conclude uh, my, my thoughts, and perhaps they're a little rambling, I apologize, uh, to think about what making the U.S. grand strategy is going to look like in the next, uh, let's say, century. Because I think it's really important, if you're trying to make a decision about the next five years, it's really hard, right? Right now, procurement officers in the Pentagon trying to figure out who our biggest adversary is going to be in 2030, and trying to figure out what type of weapon systems we're going to need uh, in a world in which nobody's actually out there on the battlefield. It's a bunch of gamers sitting at home uh, flying the drones. And if that happens, what, what implications does that have for our own morality? And how can a book written 2,000 years ago uh, and, and a savior that's risen who kind of, we, we think about in a euphemistic sense, have an actual operational control on this? And I think that's where I see the role uh, of a magazine and a journal like Providence, and I see each of you playing a role as people of faith who think about national security. Rather than running away from it and saying, well, leave unto Caesar what is Caesar's and let them fight the wars, I think increasingly we need to be running towards that space and thinking about, well, you know, there's a moral conviction that I have here. And before I start criticizing uh, the Turks for all the things they've done and, and, put, and pick the uh, speck out of my brother's eye, I've got a big log in my own eye. And I think right now it's very clear it's on full display for everyone from this town to see the problems that we have with partisanship and uh, the lack of grand strategy that we're, we're, we're living through. The problem, of course, with grand strategy tends to be you've got to identify some very key phrases early on. If you can't even call your enemy your enemy, right? Or you can't even call an adversary or a challenger, it's really difficult. So in the case of China, of course we're not against the Chinese people. Of course there's nothing but respect we have for Chinese culture and civilization. But I think the PLA and the Communist Party that runs China today and is continuing its regime uh, in Hong Kong and Xinjiang and other places around that area need to be called out for what they are. And if you're going to have that uh, kind of euphemism of saying, okay, we're going to have an economic space and a security space, and you know, in the security sphere, we're adversaries, but on, on the economy, we can have a win-win. Well, that plays right into the hands of debates such as 5G or AI or super quantum computing, because that is the battlefield of the future. And so if you are allowing uh, a so-called commercial entity that is taking direct back with the Chinese state to do different things, then we're not playing on the same field. And I think that's where a country like Japan is actually a little bit ahead of the curve. Right? Asians don't tend to punch you in the face. That's not the style of fighting Japanese have. There's a reason that they're called ninjas, right? They kill you in your sleep. They don't, you don't even see them coming, right? And one of the things I find most fascinating is when it comes to Middle East politics or even fighting, you walk up to the person, you tell them you hate that person, and you punch them in the face, and then you go grab a beer afterwards, right? And since they're Muslim, they're not supposed to be drinking, it's okay, we don't tell anybody, right? Whereas in, in Asian culture, generally, you, you, you never say anything direct. You never would say anything insulting to anybody's face, at least. But then when they're not looking, you stab them in the back, right? And so I think in some ways, that's exactly what we're, we're, we're confronting. Americans tend to think of ourselves as straight shooters, and you call it like you see it. The problem is sometimes that has direct ramifications. And I think in the case of North Korea, right? 
peninsula context, uh, putting on this charade of a conversation uh, only delays the inevitable, which is that we clearly don't have the same view on this. So either North Korea is going to become a, a nuclear regime that is acknowledged and has its own place to play in the world as a realist power, or there's going to have to be change at some point in time that is going to be driven mostly from Beijing. And when I see Russia today, there's no love lost between the Russians and the Chinese, right? The biggest threat that most Russians feel is from China. There's only 3 million Russians living in Siberia. There's well over 100 million Chinese that are right along their borders. And we'd love to just walk right across the border uh, and take that part over. And yet, somehow, the US foreign policy up until now has done an amazing job of bringing these two powers directly together. And if you look at the foreign policy space, the two greatest winners in the last decade, at least, have been China and Russia, whether it's the war in Iraq, whether it's the Iran confrontation, whether it's North Korea, whatever it is, we seem to be on the wrong side of history on all of these areas. And I'm not just talking about the wrong side of history from a moral point of view, but I'm saying from an actual strategic point of view, we are lightning years behind where we were uh, at the beginning of the Cold War when the great kind of fathers of grand strategy and foreign policy thinking like George Kennan and others were walking uh, these streets that we walk now. And I'll return to where I began uh, of the lack of leadership. And so I hope that there is a new generation in this room and beyond that can lead us there. I'm a little bit, obviously, pessimistic at the moment, but I'm an optimist at heart. Thankfully, uh, I've got 10 years to spare. My prediction is the US is going to be going through one of these moments uh, where we look at ourselves internally, a little bit like after Watergate, uh, and kind of the Vietnam War that kind of shook our fundamental faith in ourselves. That's not a prediction of what the impeachment means. It's simply a statement uh, that I think that no matter what political party wins the next election, it's going to be more about domestic politics, and we're going to increasingly lose space uh, in our ability to shape the world outside. And what it means is that uh, 10 years from now, we have this major opportunity. And I'm an optimist. I never think we should bet against the United States of America, uh, both in terms of just the, the raw talent and also the resources we have. Um, you can't pick uh, a continent or a space between you know, one, one sea with the Atlantic and the Pacific and having neighbors like Canada and Mexico uh, to, to kind of have one of these land masses uh, and be a superpower like we have been without acknowledging uh, how blessed we are in that sense and the providence in which we have. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. So I think we have five minutes or so. If, we're, if we stay on track, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has them. Or if I have not completely depressed you by the end of the day. <laughs> sure. If you'll introduce yourself, that'll also help me. Gordon Middleton, Patrick Henry College. Um, certainly some reports coming out of Turkey about the amazing move of God's presence and spirit there mm -hmm. in Muslims coming to a faith in Jesus. Yeah. At the same time, as you've described, the government tends to be on a trajectory going toward a harder Islamic position. A, can you confirm either of those, perhaps the first more than the second, I think you already addressed that, and perhaps going from grand strategy to cosmic strategy, um, how do you see those two vectors interacting, and what does that potentially look like for the future? So the first thing I have to say is I have a dear friend that went to Patrick Henry and played on your basketball team many moons ago when I played basketball. We went to Brazil together. He was the best player I, we'd ever had, and I'd never heard of Patrick Henry College until then, so I have a lot of respect for you guys. So, um, so Patrick Henry College is known for its basketball players. Clearly, <laughs> right? Division mean, three is like just where it's at. Um, uh, really not that good is why I was playing with him. Um, the first part. I think I addressed it a little bit in the article that I write about. Um, if you're looking for numeric indicators, Turkey's not a very optimistic place to look, right? It's literally illegal to be a missionary. The term missionary means to convert somebody with the sword that came to them from the Crusades. So when I would describe what my parents do, which is kind of awkward, right? What do your parents do? Oh, yeah, they're murderers who use a sword to convert people. That's not what I wanted. So I said my dad is a pastor and my mom is a first grade English teacher because at the time that was functionally what they were doing. A lot of respect for that. The people of the book, great, wonderful. You know, Istanbul is one of these amazing places where you can go to Asia and Europe in a couple of minutes, and also you can like throw a stone between a mosque, a synagogue, and a church, and whatever type of church you want to find. The problem is, as we saw with Andrew Brunson, uh, Pastor Brunson, the, the uh, whatever term you want to use here, I have to be careful, hostage, you know, faith, or faith opponent, whatever. Um, and he's coming out with a book soon, that'll be interesting to read his experience. But clearly, um, there's a suspicion, to put it lightly, of people of faith in Turkey whose entire mission is focused on uh, converting people. 
my approach on this, and I, I had the privilege of working for the U.S. Embassy, and oftentimes I would come across come across Christian workers there who were there uh, on non-missionary visas, but were doing missionary work. Which, from my perspective as a Christian, we're all called to be missionaries, right? Like, just because the Southern Baptist Convention pays my parents' salary doesn't mean that we get a pass, right? Just because I give to the Lottie Moon doesn't mean that I can be like, well, I don't need to tell anybody about Christ's love, right? We're all called to do that. It's a really lazy and a very American way of doing things. And so I got pretty heated with some of my colleagues uh, who were over there um, who would say that they were working in an import-export business and did no business. Because I'm like, you just look foolish. Like, you're a horrible businessman. So if you're going to use the title businessman, do it well. I think the Mormon Church is a great example of this. They do it through the lady. Like, there's no Mormon who's over there as a missionary. They are there doing work, like teaching English. They actually are running businesses and doing all these things. So if you're gonna, if you're going to convert Christians, and I think the the, the, the point you're referencing, um, there is, I mean, God can move in miraculous ways. And actually, the tougher and more difficult it is, the better off it is for God, right? I think about my experience with Palestinians, right? There's no people in the world that have suffered more. Uh, than the Palestinians, whatever political statement that may be. But you think about the, the, the heart of Christianity and some of our most uh, you know, historic sites, whether it's in Bethlehem or others, you know, when people think about Jesus as a Christian, most people think about them looking like most of the people in this room. I guarantee you Jesus was not this light skin, right? He lived in a part of the world that they resembled much more people of Israel today or Palestinians. And I think the challenge has been that oftentimes, in our own American Christian understanding of things, we believe you have to do things our way. This American exceptionalism is not just for foreign policy, it's in our Christian faith too. And when I think about the global south and the, the rise of Christianity, increasingly we're not in the driver's seat of foreign policy or even uh, Christian doctrine these days. So we've seen very clearly the Methodist Church, right? And I think it's very interesting to watch um, uh, how uh, Christianity is working in Turkey because literally if you go to Cappadocia this is where St. Paul, you know, Antioch the very first church in the world was in Turkey right, in, in Antakya which is right where there's close to a million refugees from Syria huddled around these caves where uh, St. Peter started his church, first church and the Catholic church grew. And so to go from that period of time to today where I think numerically there's only 7,000 Christians who go by that name in Turkey you have to put your uh, religious creed, because that's the legacy of the Ottoman period. There are a lot of people that have Muslim on their card that are very much like people here who call themselves Christians, uh, but don't particularly have a community of faith, or don't particularly have any real uh, persuasion, but they like to celebrate Christmas and Easter, but don't have a personal uh, faith. And so in many ways, I find it much easier to work in a place like Turkey, where it's so dry, it's so, so clear cut. Uh, you know, I prayed before most of my meals, and I would invite uh, my Muslim friends to do that with me. They thought it was the greatest thing ever. Like, this is amazing. We have a we have a prayer we, we say, but it's kind of formulaic, and we just kind of chant. We don't actually have any meaning about it. You actually think about what you're saying, and you bless this food, and talk about the, the people that are around there, and you're able to actually have a personal relationship with your God. Like, that's awesome. That's appealing. But increasingly, it's harder and harder to get people that have that bicultural and cultural uh, ability. Uh, and and, it, and it, it kind of hurts me a little bit to say this, but I just feel like the Americans I see increasingly of faith and the, the, the idea that they have of going over there is to basically take a Bible to the middle of the street and start thumping people upside the head with it without realizing that you're really making it difficult for the indigenous Christian population. You're actually hurting them. If you come all the way from Texas, and I'm picking on Texas, I love Texas, but they happen to be mostly from Texas, from Delta, they would come to <laughs> Ankara and they would go to the street corner. They almost wanted to get arrested because it was a great story to tell that company. I was like in the country where Paul got arrested and I got arrested too. That may be great for you and as an embassy official having to get your sorry butt out of jail, um, it's annoying to me. But what does it do to the other Christians there? Because then they're like, oh yeah, you need outside support. Oh yeah, that Andrew Brunson, he's working with CIA. Look what he's doing. He's related to the coup. So I don't blame uh, kind of Andrew Brunson or his family and the work. He has a passionate heart for the Turkish people. Even now, despite everything that's happened to him, he preaches forgiveness, right? Um, and when you look at kind of the defining moment in U.S.-Turkey relations over the last three years under this president, President Trump, the Brunson affair is kind of the top one. Um, and so I think there is a role and there's a special place that we all have to play, but we need to play it with a sense of humility and a sense of understanding of the region. Um, I probably lost track of your second part of your question. What was it? Thank you. Okay, good. Maybe time for one more question, or do you want me to end here? Sure. Yeah, one more time. Okay, go ahead. Yes, question. Sorry. To Wen Lee from South Korea. Okay. So I have a question about the Grand Lee. So I guess I O liberals and many people in South Korea would be worried about what they view as almost like a self-fulfilling outcome of hawks, uh, U.S. hawks, um, race to the bottom strategy on China. But they, they will feel that 
what could be avoided actually becomes a reality. More U.S. becomes hawkish toward China, and China bounces back by becoming equally hawkish, yeah. and the countries in the middle get into crossfire. So, in your view, do you believe that U.S. China's, uh, I guess, second Cold War is almost inevitable, or is something that, with reasonable prudence and cooler heads, can be prevent can be prevented? Yeah. So two things. Um, unfortunately, we're already in a second Cold War. Right? Okay. We can't avoid that. Right? China's already made it very clear that the Great Chinese Firewall will prevent uh, anyone from entering, and we have to make choices. The 5G is a great example, right? Uh, the recent action by the administration against Huawei is a very clear indication that anything that you do or say on any Chinese network is no longer open, right? Uh, it is clearly being controlled and used. Now, we can make the case that Apple also has this treasure trove, but really this is not a competition between Washington and Beijing. This is a competition between Beijing and Silicon Valley. I, I would argue that GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon have a lot more in that struggle than anybody in Washington has, and we're just trying to play catch up. Having said that, we're not quite at a Cold War yet, right? Okay. And it's very different, right? Because the Soviet Union was economically cut off from the rest of the world, and the free world, as we called it, uh, and, the, and the leader of the free world who sat here in Washington, really was able to mobilize people together. So our grand strategy, uh, my professor at Yale, John Gaddis, talks about empire by invitation or empire by force. The Soviet Union was an empire by force. They literally forced everyone behind the Iron Curtain to be part of their, uh, their side, uh, whereas the Americans generally were invited in. Now, sometimes we invited ourselves, and we stayed a little longer than we should have, but yeah, more or less, if you have to make a choice in the world between who you were going to go with, the Americans were the most benign influence. My fear about what's happening now goes back to my point about leadership. We're lacking leadership everywhere, right? I don't actually think Xi Jinping is a particularly strong leader, right? That's a controversial statement, but I don't think he is. I don't think a, a strong or, or visionary leader like Mao would have let the problems in Hong Kong persist to where they are. I don't think that the Uyghur problem would get to where it is. Yes, I don't believe that there's going to be some flowering of opening where these things would happen, but they were pretty mismanaged, right? And what's amazing to me is instead of us being able to take that to our advantage, we actually like bungle even worse, right? And what I mean by that is we are driving ourselves into a world in which we are exactly what you said, self-professing uh, strategy. And since you're from South Korea, let me just point this out. There is no bigger strategic threat to US-China than what's happening right now between South Korea and Japan. These are our two closest allies in the region, and what's happening they're going at a Cold War at each other. You as a South Korean going to Japan will be accused of different things, right? Japanese buying South Korean products will be accused of not being loyal. That's absurd, right? We have more military forces, the Army on the Korean Peninsula, Air Force and Navy on the Japanese islands, than anywhere else in the world, and yet we're allowing this to go back and forth. Now, you could say, well, we're not, it's not our problem, Joshua. That may be true, but these are two treaty allies that now don't have an intelligence sharing agreement I don't particularly have a fond view of President Moon right now, obviously, but I also don't have a very fond view of what the Japanese began by putting people on the white list. There were mistakes made on both sides. And the thing that's most egregious to me, because I'm not Japanese and I'm not South Korean, is the lack of U.S. leadership. And that lack of leadership is present everywhere that we've seen, right? And to me, the South Korea-Japan situation is far worse. Now, I could make the case that South Korea is no longer a U.S. ally because it's already in the Chinese orbit. Right? When you think about the level of integration between the Chinese economy and South Korea, when you think about these different things going on, I can basically look out 20 years and see a scenario in which South Korea would much rather get along with its more powerful neighbor to the north and its neighbor to the north immediately, North Korea, than have some type of peace settlement. Because if the peace settlement is going to be a preemptive strike, a bloody nose, so to speak, against North Korea, that's probably not in South Korea's immediate interest because of the lives that we lost. But I still believe, maybe naively, that the U.S. power in this region is not necessarily by forcing people to do things, but by providing good offices and opportunities to drive in that direction. And when I think about South Korea's economy and how interlinked it is to the Japanese, and I think about people in this town who are making lots of decisions about how to deal with the fallout from the pushback against China and the supply chain, the last thing we need right now are the two most powerful allies we have there and the two biggest economies going at it like children right now. So that might be a little harsh, but that's kind of what I'm feeling right now. Thank you. <laughs>